Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Hubker, and I am the founder of the Mindfulness Project. And the Mindfulness Project, um, I wanted to say we, but it's not a we, it's just me. Um, the Mindfulness Project is a very small business that caters to anybody that's gone through um, childhood traumas, um, adult traumas, or um, it's a business that you just want to feel better. Um, I teach trauma-informed yoga, meditation, mindfulness. Um, I do journaling seminars with kids. It's just um, the Mindfulness Project is a feel-good business, and um, it correlates with living in the present moment. And right now, with the way the world is right now, we need to go back to basics, and the basics are living in the present moment. Hello, hello, hello. I'm like, this is one of those, again, I, at this point, like, so I've done um, over a hundred interviews, conversations, interviews, fun, laughing moments. And I still get so excited when I get to catch up with old friends. So everyone, Andrea and I went to high school together and she was one year younger than me. And I was, oh, I got those classmates with her brother, Carlo. And what a wonderful time this is that I get to, I mean, I'm not, I mean, the, the, this moment, this pandemic has got me to reconnect with all of you. So I get to hear what you're working on and I get to catch up. So this is, ah, these are my happy moments. Yes. We have to find the silver lining, Jody. Oh my, you know, and I have found many. So we're going to talk about that. Okay. But before we talk about work, we need to talk about who you are. So like, share with everyone, where are you? Who are you? How mm -hmm. do you grow up? The whole entire, like the background, because everyone needs to understand that before a business started, there was a person. Yes. I want to introduce the person. I know the person, yes. I know the, <laughs> but I want everyone to know who Andrea is. So just like you, Jody, um, I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts in a tiny, quiet little cul-de-sac on the west side. Um, I, as you know, I have, I have two brothers. I don't know if you know the oldest, but you know Carlo. Um, and we're still very, very close. He lives in the same town as me. We both have two kids. Um, you know, but I am okay um, because I'm, if I'm not going to be vulnerable and open up the vault a little bit, you're not going to fully grasp who I am and why I do this work. And um, I will be vulnerable and say that it was a tough upbringing. Um, our dad is, is still alive. My parents are alive and married, but super old school upbringing, um, you know, very dictatorship. Hate to say that, but yes, um, narcissistic, strict, um, not a lot of touchy feely, lovey dovey upbringing. Really hard, hard knocks. And through that tough love, you you get lost because uh, listen, everybody needs that love you, hug, kiss, great job. I know you can do it, buddy. Or yes, you're you know you're a great dancer, or you're pretty, or we didn't have that. So my brothers and I got, you know, there was fighting and stuff, but we gravitated toward each other, towards each other because I think that's what happens. You look for somebody that's like-minded, who's going through the same. So, you know, fast forward to, you know, my upbringing, we all have different upbringings. I ended up going to New York City at 19 years old to study fashion. I worked at wait, the before, wait, wait, before, before, you, before you, I'm going to stop you for a second, before you go. So, yeah, your yeah. first generation or your second generation. So, like, so, I, I mean, we're, I'm first generation born in, in America, um, I conceived in Haiti. My mom was eight and a half months pregnant, came to America. Um, the fear, I mean, my parents, everyone, I mean, like everyone knew Mr. Charles. I mean, just as strict. I mean, look, you are, you're telling the story that I'm like, oh, I, I know that story very well. But also as I got older, it was more so that we came to a country that we were unaware of with kids and the fear was there. So did you have that with your parents? Was, was that something that you investigated and you found? Or was it just like a full on, this is my personality? Because um, like people, like, just, just the way people understand like what, what culture you're coming from. Right. Okay. So we're a hundred percent Italian. My father is from Naples, Italy. So, you know, first generation, um, my mother is a hundred percent Italian, but she was born in Boston. Her parents were from, were from Italy. So 
We are the Ucholis. That's my maiden name. We're 100% Urcholi, Andrea Marie Ucholi. <laughs> we are Italian, 100%. And, you know, my dad was one of nine. He was born during World War II. And I don't think he met his father. I think he met his dad when he was five years old because he was stuck in a, a, a POW camp and there was a lot of childhood traumas. And as we know, um, right now, yes, I did study it, Jody, because what happens to your parents gets passed on. It's called patterning. And whatever that lineage was, here it is. It, it goes on to the children. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this later because it's very important for this podcast. And I know we ran over, but it's so vital for our health and well-being to break the pattern for our children so they don't drink the Kool-Aid that I drank and to be self-aware and notice. So to, to answer your question, Jody, extremely strict, 100% I say Southern, Southern Italian because they're different from the Northerners, you know, not in a judgmental way, but you know, we're different. The way we eat, the way we talk with our hands, the explosive personality, um, that molded our family, if that answers your question. Yep, yep. It, properly. It, it answers it perfectly. But I just, I did, as you were talking before you went into New York, I just wanted to okay. make sure that it was very clear. So go ahead. Okay, so then, okay, so then I did end up, I almost felt like, I know this is a tough thing to say, but I almost felt like I escaped. I escaped to live in New York City, but I did have a strong, my love for fashion was like inside my chest. Um, and, and I was also a dancer. I'm like, oh, should I move to Manhattan to be a dancer? Or should I study fashion? And I remember my dad saying something negative, like, oh, if you're a dancer, you'll just starve to death. Oh my I'm god! Like, my, like, I, I wanted well, I wanted to be an actress, and my dad's like, "I go, they're all drug dealers." I'm like, "What?" Oh, okay, so you. <laughs> so I always instead of saying you're lovely at both, it's your choice. I got starvation. I thought of a skeleton. So all of these negative comments, Jody, were just like they, they stuck in my. They call them meridians, and we'll go over meridians later. Stuck, mm -hmm. stuck, stuck. They get inside of your body, and you know what? It starts to hurt. So I moved to Manhattan. I stayed for 15 years. I don't want to get into the whole fashion industry, but I had a ball. I, I ran this business. I got to see amazing things. And then I was there for 9-11, which was, I was right in front of the Empire State Building, completely traumatized. I saw everything in front of me. I think I suffered PTSD for a short time, but um, I did get help. I've, I've always been self-aware to get rid of pain and figure out how to holistically get rid of pain. So I did that. And I ended up moving back to Boston, continued with the industry. And I think because of my upbringing and because of my really difficult divorce, I, I just went through a very, very, uh, really heart heartbreaking divorce. That's what made me gravitate to the works of mindfulness because I could not stand the inner pain anymore. Okay, it, wait, 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 again, I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, cause from growing up, the, the experience in New York, how long were you in New York? So I stayed for 15 years in Manhattan. 15 years, I'm not jumping over 15 years, friend. <laughs> like, so you're, you're not going from being a childhood to the okay. 15 years of your life. Um, being in New York, I mean, I, I mean, I was born in New York, um, I, 90% of my American base relatives are in New York. Um, and I have to say that New York is my, like when I, when I would need to decompress I, like as weird as, as it is, cause I'm so high energy, I go into high energy and it decompresses me. It's like, that's me too. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's weird for people that don't understand that, but it yes. works very well for me. Um, fashion industry in a high energy city from, and you're from Massachusetts in a small town. How was that for you? Because as exciting as it is, it's a lot. You didn't just go into, I don't know, I don't know, name X, Y, Z job. You went into fashion. fashion. I feel like fashion and finance in Manhattan is a hotbed. So how was that for you going from being this kid in a small town? I mean, it might do the small sports town. I mean, it was like, I mean, we grew up in a very, very, I mean, our, our, just so people understand, Brockton, Rocky Marciano, Rocky Marciano money was being fueled as long as that Marciano was in the school system. I mean, it was just like the abundance of sports, division one, 
always on us. But again, small town. We, we were known for something. Now you're going into New York. How are you? How are you found in that area? How did you make yourself be known for 15 years? Well, first of all, moving. My cover was college. I mean, I I went to school in Boston for two years, and then I transferred to a very small. Um, it was not FIT. It was a division of Fordham. It was the Laboratory Institute of Merchandising, which is the business of fashion. I did not go to be a, a, an artist, a designer, um, but we were in that realm that um, that um, the field of design and fashion. But I wanted the business end of it. I wanted to be a, a merchandiser, a buyer, and, and work in the showrooms. How was it, Jody? I I escaped Brockton because at that point it wasn't enough for me. Um, I felt like you know, the high school was enormous. As you know, we had 4,000 students and I may be off by 600, but it was approximately, you know, 4,000. And, you know, I had my click and you had your click and it was great, but I just never felt like I had an identity. And I gravitated, I bet you, if you really dug deep into my, who I am, I bet you I gravitated towards fashion because I didn't feel known as a child. My father didn't say, that's my daughter. And she does this, this, and this. So maybe I wanted to study fashion because fashion is beautiful and you're known and your name is known and people are gonna fall, whether you're in business or you're a designer, people are gonna start to know you. And if I really dug deep with a therapist, maybe that was the reason why I did it because I, I slowly had to you know, build my resume and I did find great jobs. I, I went from, fearful to just do the work. You know, I used to meditate and talk to myself on how to be calm and how to speak slowly because I was always so excited and I would speak like this because I was raised in such a chaotic environment. And you know what, Jody? I went from one chaotic environment because my because my dad was a yeller, very vocal, never a soft voice, to another. So I guess it was kind of the same but I, just like you said five minutes ago about Manhattan settling you, something about New York City, Jody, settled me. Just all the people around me and all different colors. I loved color and I loved that everybody's so different and that the person next to me was homeless and the person to the right of me had four Mercedes. I loved the melting pot, I didn't care where you were from, I wanted to know and learn about everybody. And boy, did I. I mean, you were forced into learning about religion and people's backgrounds. And I did business with, you know, people with turbans on and it, it just, it didn't matter. But I love that because I was done with the Brockton. I was done with the smallness mentality. I love that. Um, and, it, and it's funny because I live there, but every other weekend I was in New York or once a month I was in Montreal and yet no one knew that, but that's where our relatives were. And our parents made it very clear where we live one place, but we are, we're being raised with our relatives and the relatives don't need to be next door, but we need to be aware of them. So for me, the way that I, look, I mean, you're not the first person from Brockton that, I, that I've had these conversations with. And it's so funny how I'm seeing how all of you guys saw the town and how you guys were raised. And I'm like, oh wait, what are you talking about? But I was, my, our parents were very, very strategic about making sure that we were raised in other, we were living here, but we were raised in other locations, which is really interesting that you were in New York and you experienced something that I experienced my entire life, but took it for granted because it was just, well, we're just gonna go to the relative's house, that's it. Um, and, I, and I love that you saw that, you saw all the essences of what makes a location that much like more vibrant. I know this isn't a very kind thing to say, but I remember, Jody. I never missed a holiday. I never missed a beat. I mean, I would fly home just to have turkey and fly right back for a meeting. I was back and forth and back. And I was able to. I, I was doing well. But I remember coming home and not wanting to be there. I remember coming home and feeling a sense of loss. I don't know. And I have, and I have great memories. I had beautiful girlfriends and, and I didn't have like a horrendous life, but I, I felt some sort of, what am I doing here? And what am, am I growing here? Am I learning here? I did love coming home and seeing Carlo and hanging out, but then I wanted to get back to the city because it had 
oomph and it had style and it and I just felt like I learned something new about the world every day in that one city. I think that's, but that's the thing where when you're growing up, going home is just like a chore. It becomes a chore. <laughs> oh boy, you said it. <laughs> it. It really does. It becomes like, you're like, I go and you get the phone calls and then you get the guilt trips. It's part of that. But then as you're getting older, coming home is definitely part of the memories. I mean, it's not just like that. It's not the house, but it's more so just you're watching people get older. You're having... Uh, different conversations. I mean, it's a different world when you're older, but when you're trying to discover yourself, yeah. home is a disruption of discovering who I am as a person yes. and what I want to contribute to the world. Agreed. Okay, so 15 years, you're in the industry for, I mean, like, and, and what, or, like, what companies did you work for? So um, I did a program for Saks Fifth Avenue Manhattan, and it was amazing. I worked in the men's department. I got to meet Liam Neeson and Madonna. I remember delivering jeans to Madonna's apartment when she wasn't that big. And there was actually a, a doorman that received my package. And I met amazing people in Drew Barrymore and I, I had dinner with really important people. And I don't, I don't know if I should say this, but I met Donald Trump. I worked in Trump Tower. Oh, I didn't just say that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I went to a show well, again, and I just- my, I Minus Trump. the four years, he was like a person that entertained. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't want to get into that. I would never get into politics, but I remember doing something for a family. I was a nanny and I was with Marla Maples and they introduced me to Donald. But, oh my God, the stories go on and on. So I had an amazing 15 years. Um, I worked for Saks Fifth Avenue in a management program, but I didn't want the big showy retail. That was just a college, um, you know, for college credits. And I had a blast and I met a lot of friends. But I ended up working for really high-end, tiny uh, European boutiques. Mm -hmm. And that's where I sort of got discovered. I remember a woman walking in and handing me her black credit card. And she said, I want you to dress my daughter. And I remember saying, what's, what's the financial limit? And she said, there is no limit. And she said, you're going to come work for me. I own a showroom on Broadway. And I sell seven lines to every ma major retailer, you know, all over the country and in Europe, and you're going to work for me. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, petrified to resign. I was so scary. That's like the most mindful thing in the world to even hear about. Uh, I was just like, I, I wanted to work for a showroom, but who's going to get my little resume coming from, who's going to look at me? And back in the day, there was no Indeed. And there was no, you know, I don't think there was Monster. You had to walk up. No, 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 no. Yeah, it, it literally was like your personality that you got you the job. Jody, that was the only way. Mm -hmm. And I must have offered her a coffee or dressed her daughter. There was some verbal dialogue. Her name was Paula Cohen. She is deceased. And she, um, she molded me and I had a really, it was hard, Jody. They were almost, what they did to the girls in the showroom, I don't know if I can say this on camera, but it would be called abuse today. It, well, it, well, it's, all right, so it's funny because I try to explain to my interns um, or my assistant the stories of when I first started in my career in the media. And I'm like, I go, it was a free for all. It was a free for all of what could be said, what could be done. What, I mean, it was a free for all. And you learned, and that was the, I mean, literally that was the essence. And I felt like I go, my dad prepared me for any job that I could have ever had until, <laughs> until I had the job. And then I was like, holy crap, I thought I was prepared and I wasn't prepared for that. No, no, we were, we were all, um, I was in charge. We hired the models to do the showroom, to do the, you know, the clothes and to walk in front of the buyer, like from Saks Fifth Avenue, that's ready to spend, you know, $20 million with us. We were there showing the collection. So my, you know, what was on the line every, and if they didn't buy the collection, it wasn't the collection's fault. It was my fault yeah. because oh. I'm sure that I turned wrong or my hip was wrong or I wore the wrong skirt or, and I've been told numerous times, don't ever, that, you know, the devil wears Prada. And yeah, that, that was, was me. Oh my God, oh my God. That's my, that was me. I kissed one away. Oh, yeah. don't ever, Jody, Jody, this is what I, I'll never forget this excuse me, Andrea. And I'm like, oh yeah, ready for the compliment. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, don't wear that skirt ever again. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Go in the bathroom, bawling, 
wiping my nose. And you know, and it's so funny because how it molds you because I'm waiting daily for any crumb. I would have taken a crumb of like, you know, the way you, and I remember one day she gave me that crumb, Jody. She actually said to me, because she no compliments in this business, never. They leave you hanging by a rope, searching for a validation, right? Jody, I remember her saying to me, um, Andrea, I just, because I remember um, this collection that we sold, Day More Couture, we sold uh -huh. it to like um, Missy, um, a, a more mature clientele for weddings. Mm -hmm. And I remember I sold like, bonkers one day just crazy numbers and it was the collection it was beautiful fabrics and stuff and I remember her saying to me you have a good eye that's <laughs> all I needed like my eyes are good you, it was like saying you're the most gorgeous girl in the world Jody she said you have a good eye and I was like I'm in I'm in the industry it, it was just there was no validation, Jody. No, 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 honestly, I mean, I mean, I, again, I'm, this is where we're, we're both name dropping. I go, but I remember when I <laughs> when I was in the radio, I mean, in radio, and I literally was like, hey, why? I, I think that we should have Oprah on the show, and they're like, oh, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Oprah, the Oprah will never do the show. I'm like, I go, what are you talking about? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. I came up with every single plan in the world just to be seen by by, by Oprah's people. Finally, we get Oprah on the show. We are the only station in Boston. I know, so like everyone got to get one-on-ones on, -ones on a round table. We're the only station in Boston to be in her hotel room for a one-on-one. -on -one. It was my moment. I went to Ann Taylor. I had my Ann Taylor suit, which still hangs in the closet. The whole yeah. <laughs> we do this interview. It is the most epic. I am floating on water. I would get in the elevator and I get the, what? Great job. What's on the show tomorrow? I'm like, oh. Come on, can we not just live in the moment right now? Come on. Right, right, right. But but it was one of those moments like like we laugh about it now, but at the time it's just like deflation. Oh my god. I'm yeah, deflating. constant. Yeah, that that it took a blow to, which is why I love what I do right now. I like I I don't know if it's a 360 or a 180, but I completely I loved that, but I knew it was almost like fast forward to 9-11 so the industry i was there forever and then i ended up going into jewelry i sold tons of jewelry for a bunch of different showrooms and they flew me to las vegas every year and los angeles i mean it was so cool and, and fun and i worked like a dog though i worked six days a week my lower back was killing me i mean i worked grueling hours but i had a blast and i was young and single and it was totally it was great but when 9-11 hit i saw everything and th that's an important piece of my life because a lot of people say, oh yeah, I, I felt it too. I was in Boston. And, and you know what? You don't know unless you were in the city. I literally got off my little jitney because I had moved to Weehawken, New Jersey, which is right there yeah. for, um, for one year. And I got my coffee and my little Bialy from my uh, Egyptian little cart outside. Um, and I worked across the street from the M Empire State Building. And I had lived the year prior in Battery Park City, right across from World Trade Center One. That was my apartment, could throw a rock to my window. And I got my breakfast, got off, and I looked up and I saw the first plane go in, right there, right in front of me. And I was like, oh, that's pretty awful. And I was only on the ninth floor of this um, jewelry building and my boss, who was from Lebanon, used to dictate and preach about this Osama bin Laden. And I remember saying, shut up, I just wanna sell jewelry. You're always talking about the world and politics. I, I couldn't stand it because that's just not who I am. I, I don't like fear and chaos in my life because mm -hmm. I was raised in that. So um, he opened the window and he's like, Andrea, get up here now. And I was like, all right, cool your jets. I'll, I'll be up in a minute. I'm just getting my breakfast. And I went up and I stuck my head out the window. So I believe the timeline was seven minutes. By the time I got up, which I might be off by a minute, six to eight minutes was the second. And I put my head out, bam, we saw the second plane go in. He said, see, I told you we're under attack. And I said, holy shit, it was so awful. I remember my chest, the phones went dead immediately, tried to call my family. It was crazy. Um, so long story short, we, we, um, we ran 
to catch a boat to New Jersey. We ran 50 blocks. It was 82 degrees that day on September 11th. I had high heels on. I took them off and I ran with him. Were there other people in the office? It was just you and the, this gentleman. It was him and I. We were always the early birds because we ran the showroom together. Um, nobody was in yet. So I remember we all had cell phones, cr- crappy cell phones, but they worked. Yep. And I remember him saying, go back. He had an apartment in Manhattan and I didn't. I had just moved out. And he said, come back to my place. And I said, no. I, I got to get home. I got to get out of here. I started having a panic attack. I said, my cousin works in the World Trade Center and my, my father's brother's son. And I said, I got to find him. I got to find him. So we ran 50 blocks to get a boat to go to Hoboken or Weehawken. There's two, there's two ferries. Yep. There was about 10,000 people in line to get a boat. And um, the National Guard or somebody came up to me with a gun and they said, you can get on the boat if you're, if you have a child or you're pregnant. And I said, no, I, I, I said, no, I said, I just live in this. He's like, you're not going, you're not getting on the boat. So we were, I was trapped in the city and I left my boss. I couldn't stand. Um, I, I didn't want to, I don't know. I wanted to leave him and find my cousin. So I remember bumping into a girlfriend of mine who lived in Queens and she was bawling her eyes out, panic attack. And I said, come with me. We're going to walk to Chelsea, run to Chelsea. We're going to find my cousin. And when we find him, we will sleep at his place. And um, we did. We waited on his stoop for about three hours. Um, Then I got the calls from Carlo and everybody's like, get on the train, get on the Acela, get back to Boston. Couldn't get on a train. You couldn't leave the city. We were trapped. There was no way to get home. And people don't realize Amtrak was shut down for eight weeks. I could, I had a car. I couldn't drive to Boston. The roads were shut down. Everyone keeps saying, why didn't you get in the car after a week or two? You couldn't leave. You, we were trapped. Yeah, yeah it's, one, it's one of the things where, so we, that's when I was working in, um, in TV and we were one of the first television stations in Manhattan during, I mean, like we were, there was New York uh, media, but then Connecticut didn't know what was going on. And literally Boston was there. We, we were, we were there and it was just one of those moments where, what are you seeing? What's going on here? Um, it was just weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of coverage and raw coverage. And I think that was one of the things that traumatized people the most where people didn't know what was going on. So raw coverage was showing everything that you were seeing. Yeah. With their it, was, um, it brought back, I have a, like, I even just got a trigger right now because I could smell, I, I can smell it when I talk about it. Um, I could smell the flesh. I could see, I saw stuff. I saw everything. Um, it was, an absolute nightmare. And I remember um, Sergio, my cousin, finally in his beautiful suit, you know, worked in finance, walk, covered in soot, walking back up to us. And I'm like, oh my God, you're alive because we didn't think he made it. And um, uh, we all collapsed and we went back into his place. It was a really hot day. We opened up all the windows in his apartment. He was on the lower level. Mm-hmm. And I remember sleeping by the window and couldn't believe he was on 23rd Street on the west side, which is lower Manhattan, very, very short walk to the World Trade Center. And I remember army trucks up and down the streets. Like, I, I don't think people realize that it was such a, how fast those army trucks got into the city. And, and men, I, guess, I don't know what they were. They were in the army, I guess, or National Guard, just with Uzis all up and down the street. And I just remember, I, I went into like a blackout. I was com- terrified, completely terrified because I did see a plane circle Empire State Building, which was supposed to get hit. Um, that was on the list and um, it did not. I wouldn't be here today if it was because I was directly across the street and the, the, the way the buildings are set, they collapse so quickly, as you know. Yep. So, um, you know, I got through that. I have such amazing memories in Manhattan. I will never forget 9-11. Um, I ended up staying for one more year, but that one year, Jody, was such a drag for all the industries. Mm-hmm. The fashion industry completely collapsed. I remember going into the office. My phone never rang. It was quiet. It was. I, I was determined to stick it out, but it was my ticket to, to trickle my way back to New England and to start a new life. 
Yeah. I remember um, during that time, um, I was supposed to go on vacation to Costa Rica and Costa Rica is like, no one's coming here. So like it's, we're shut down. And um, one of my friends worked in the, uh, she was in New York. She, I mean, she's in the fashion industry in New York as well. And she was, she went to fashion week. It was, that was the, the yeah. week, fashion week was yeah. there. I know, September. And, she's, and I remember speaking to her and she's like, she goes, you know what, come and join me in Paris. And I'm like, I'm like, I go, you know what? Okay. Cause I had been in the, I mean, we had been covering over and over and over. And I was like, I remember being in battery park, like we were, on the ground and then once we walked to battery park and i saw this sign i saw the messages it became real for me where now it went from a story and interviewing people and firefighters to now i'm seeing the emotional part of it and i'm like nope 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 i don't want this part is like not what i like and this is not and not i don't like it it's just like i go I, it's taking it, it literally started to break me and also you realize how tired you are and i'm working without a mask because i'm just trying to, fo like I'm yeah. trying to focus and and then coming home and I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go to Paris. And everyone's like, you're going to Paris right now. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you crazy? I'm like, safest place in the world right now is a plane. Safe yeah. place. Yeah. Went to Paris. And when I tell you, Fashion Week Paris, empty. Empty. Like, it was it was so weird for me as yeah. well, where everyone was, I mean, like, every single time you met someone, they're like, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. I mean, people in Paris were so amazing. And they were just so apologetic. They just couldn't even believe what happened. It was just beautiful and sad at the same exact time but i mean it was oh, to be there and you'll, as you're saying your phone never rang you that's your week that's your week of being there and seeing all the most amazing innovative things and yet empty it was dead i mean the the world mourned with us which yep. was um collectively there there wasn't a country that didn't everybody got together and um it was a year of mourning. It was, I mean, I, we still, I still mourn for it. What are we on year 15 or 16? Yeah. But I still, um, I took that year and I just got my thoughts together and I knew I had to get back, um, which was really hard. I didn't move back to, to Brockton. I moved into the city. I moved into the yeah. back bay. Okay. And I got a great, I got a great gig. I ended up working for Neiman Marcus as a personal shopper. And that's when I started to sell Escada, which is a beautiful German line um, that's actually no longer in existence. But um, it, it was just such a great, the words journey, Jody, because the journey was like, you know, people want things in life. If you learn to, I, I'm a big fan of manifestation and manifesting. And when you have a thought Sometimes if you just breathe and let go, things just fall into place, even though there are some external influences that we don't like, like 9-11 and, and certain, you know, a divorce or something bad happens, you know, they're injected into our lives, but they help us grow and they help us learn. Um, and that definitely um, molded me. Um, <clears throat> and I was petrified to move back to, to, New England and what am I going to do? And do I want to work in retail? And I make half my salary and, oh, it ended up being amazing. Uh, Neiman Marcus was awesome. Um, <clears throat> and I, I met my ex-husband and we had a blast and I had my first son. I was working on the sales floor with a big belly and I went to Germany for a Scada. And I mean, I have such awesome, awesome memories but it was, it was the end of the fashion career. It was just starting to, after I had my first son, I have two sons, um, it started to um, mold me into who I am today. So who are you today? I mean, you've gone through all these different, I mean, amazing, and, and mind you, we could, we could be here for three hours. I know, we, we're gonna have coffee, Jody. You and I, we're going out. <laughs> we're going out. Um, so we're like, where did the company, so look, we're just going to go into okay. that right now. So where and how did the company come to fruition? Like, what was it that you said fashion is, I'm like, I'm cutting the ties with fashion. And now all of a sudden I decided to go this way. What happened? So Jody, it was not that severe. It was not cutting the ties. I dabbled in and out. Um, I had my first son in the city and my ex-husband um, opened up a company. He's a um, designs warehouses all over the world. And um, he traveled Monday through Friday, which was probably the demise of my marriage. He was gone all the time. So I ended up raising my boys by myself. He traveled all the time. And it was hard, hard on the relationship, hard on the kids, hard on the family. And 
I was always this girl, as you see me on screen, and I felt adored my son. Um, I felt lost. I'm like, how did I go from going to Germany, living in Manhattan, to, to making sandwiches all day long? I just felt like, who am I? So um, we made the decision to have me stay at home and not hire a nanny and to, to raise our son in the city. And I had friends and I joined the mom's group and all this, but yeah, it, it was, I, I adored being a mom. I still do, but something was missing. My son was full blown colic. So I was so sleep deprived. He cried all day and all night, all day and all night, all day and all night. And my husband traveled. So those times, those days were tough. We did not own our brownstone. We rented. So we weren't kind of in the, the, the wealthy clique. So there were all these feelings and insecurities that, you know, came on. Um, and then when Roman, my son Roman started to stand up, we knew it was time to exit that apartment mm -hmm. and find another place to live. So we rented another apartment in Mansfield so my ex-husband could get the business up and running. Um, and he did a great job at that. He's definitely um, a great businessman. Um, and then we bought this house in Easton, which is where I love and reside today. And I'm so grateful to have this home still. Um, we, we had another son four years later, but in between the two boys, I could feel the marriage dissipating. I could feel the travel getting in the way. And I could feel like this isn't the love of my life. I'm not first. I'm not number one. And when the wife isn't number one, things go sour. It's just the way both of you have to be number one. The couple has to be like putting each other. So we had a really, really hard time. I don't need to get into the nitty gritty, but it was really, really tough times. Very lonely marriage. Um, I, 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 I want you to get into the nitty gritty. Yeah, okay. And, and not to, like, just because like, we want to, um, for people to understand again, where our business comes from. Okay. From something. So, I mean, not, I mean, not, like, we, I mean, we don't have five hours. I'm not trying to say. No, I know. Go ahead. Yeah. But, you know. but I want, I want to get a better understanding of when, I mean, so you're at home, um, you're, you're a stay-at-home mom, which I, I commend all stay-at-home moms. I mean, it's a lot of work, especially because of the feeling of this is all I do. This is what I'm known for. And a lot of times after the kids go, um, they go to college and you have that empty nest syndrome that's when you're even more lost because you're like, yep. now I transitioned from this, like from the career to wife, I'm a mother, and now like what is happening here? So the company comes from what? I mean, what, where did that come? Like you, you've had so much, you, I mean, you've built up so much content, not by desire, but you, all this content has been building up in your life that has led you to this point. But what was it that, that the, um, went on? Okay. I, there was definitely um, neglect and, and sadness. And I felt like he didn't care anymore. And it, it killed me inside. My heart ached mm -hmm. and I was petrified to ask for the divorce. And I can't explain it. We all have certain childhood traumas, Jody. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's from your lineage, from an abusive parent, from uh, an abusive husband. I, we all have some level, some traumas are small and some traumas are large. And yeah. some are passed on from past lives. And we don't have to get into that today, but we all have some level. And I had it from my father. I didn't marry my father because my ex-husband wasn't vocal, but he had a lot of qualities like my father. Um, a little bit of a, a, you know, dictator and, um, you know, he wore the pants in the family and there were, there were definitely correlations. And I just felt like towards the end, I just didn't feel validated. I didn't feel respected. I didn't feel like um, I mattered. And it started to really, really hurt. And what I didn't realize that the divorce got ugly. For lack of a better phrase, it got, instead of saying, we have two beautiful sons, let's work this out and depart. It got greedy mm -hmm. and, and ugly and fearful and nasty. And we, I had to hire specialists to get help. I lived in fear, Jody, that my 
stress level in my heart chakra. I'm a Reiki practitioner. So this is your heart chakra. Mm -hmm. I felt the pain of a 10 on a daily basis, but the amount of work that I did when I was alone, when the kids were sleeping, I never watched TV. I haven't watched TV in uh, five years. I would always dive into what does this mean? Metaphysically, what does that mean? Metaphysically, what does it mean when you have lower back pain? Metaphysically, what does it mean? Because I knew if you knew why that is that you could fix it. So I knew that my job was to get that pain from a 10 to a one. And I'm going to figure out how to do this from the internet. And that's, that's what I did. I started to, I wrote a small book. It's on Amazon. Um, I wrote a book about uh, how to feel better. And I, I started to um, practice yoga and I YouTubed um, proper ways to meditate. And I got certified in Pilates. All of these things, I found out that hip openers to actually open your hips releases emotions. Bingo, I'm gonna try that. Um, you know, placing your eyes, hands over your eyes, heals your eyesight. Like I couldn't believe how these simple techniques, it fascinated me, Jody. I feel like okay. you wanna ask me something. Uh, oh my God, you, cause you know, <laughs> um, I work in the media. Um, I come from a international household. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call, what if someone says like, I go, this is all hocus pocus. So hocus pocus, like, I mean, you're like, you're looking at, I could do the same thing and Google it. Why have you become the expert in this? Because I mean, I mean, you're hearing all this information. And again, I can Google anything, but then you go to a doctor or you go to an acupuncturist and they're like, stop Googling things, stop Googling things, stop Googling things. Cause it makes their jobs harder. So what do you say to someone that is like literally hearing you and yet feeling I could do that myself? Why would I want to work with you? And like, I go, what makes you an expert? Okay, I will answer. I will answer that because you don't really know how to do it, and you don't have the confidence, Jody. And I didn't either. I remember going to my Reiki master, and I'm like, oh, I want to learn Reiki because I want to feel better. Because I had people do Reiki on me, and after I got certified in Reiki one, I was like, okay, great. I have that certification under my belt. Now I'm going to go for Reiki two. She said, No, you're not. You're not going to go to Reiki too. She put me in my place. And I said, why? And she said, because you haven't forgiven your ex-husband. You haven't forgiven yourself. You haven't forgiven life. For, for this happening to you, you have got to go to another place. And you need help. Like you need experts that have gone through their traumas that are now healed, Jody, to teach you the way. There is no way that you could, you sure you could go on the internet and you could start tapping. Tapping is another great resource. You know, I just want to feel better. I know how to love and accept myself. Uh, sure, you could YouTube that right now and it's a free, but it's, is it truly going to get inside? Probably not to the level that um, an expert could give you that resource because to release pain, you have to know, you know, where to do the tapping, where to do the touching. You do need to know hand placement and you need to learn how to breathe properly. There's a certain way to do breath work. All of, all of these things that I talk about, the yoga, the Pilates, the meditation, the mindfulness, it's not just one component that heals you. I think all of it collectively together, mixed in a pot with a big, you know, red ribbon around it. That's what healed me. I hope I explained that properly. You did. You did a very good job. I do like that a lot. Um, I'm going to pause on this for a quick second. Yeah. You have went from working for people to now creating your own business. How was it now that you're in total control of your destiny of being a founder compare, in comparison to for years working for other people? Scary. Because... I never know where my next paycheck is coming from, but I don't think I'll be happy doing something else because this work works. This healing modality is unbelievable. It is so simple and so fascinating that I would probably make, I would rather make less money and help more people. I love to help people. I love to see transformation. I see it. I see it all the time. And even know it's on a smaller level than when I used to dress thousands of women and make them all look pretty and boost their self-esteem. 
my business is still young and still growing. And I wake up every single morning with that little excitement. I can't wait to get on the mat and figure out something new that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to teach a class today at noon. And I'm, I'm already thinking in my mind, what can I do to help them? And how can I make it different? Um, you know, Jody, it is harder. Um, some days I just don't know. And I, and I substitute teach at the Eastern public schools. I have other side gigs just to keep everything afloat, but I have good intuition and I have, um, I believe you need to start your day with, I call this intention. And when you have intention and you have this feeling and, and we can tap into that at a later date, you, you can tap into your feeling about the future. And I just have a great feeling about it because we need to go back to the basics. We need to make some changes in this world. Mm -hmm. It's not about the, ex the external will never make you happy. The external is your band-aid um, until you figure out, until you hit rock bottom that you need to make some changes in your life. And I believe this work um, builds your foundation. You do go back to the basics, simple touching modalities, breath work. It's going back to, you know, infant stages. I love it. All right. So, um, Obviously we're literally, um, let's see now we're, I want, I would love to say that we're at the end of the pandemic, but we're not, yeah. we are, we're still in it. Um, we are yeah. months and months and months and months into it. Um, what do you feel in, from what you're seeing from the people, from your clients, um, from your studies, where do you see, we, where do we, you see us going once we're open? Once everything's open, people like 70% of individuals are vaccinated. Where do you think, what, what happens? Because a lot of people are talking about PTSD because now you're leaving your house. Now you're taking a train again. People are coming close to you and you can see people already freaking out about just like the thought of that. Um, a lot of people are leaving their jobs because they're like, you know what? If you're telling me that I have to go back to work, it's not gonna happen. Um, I have a friend that works in a very large company, very well-known company, and they have a, the most amazing, amazing, amazing boss. And she's just, she's not reading the room. She's not reading the room where it's like, she's like, I want everyone back in the office in the next two weeks. And she's not reading the room and people are starting to leave. And they're like, the entire team now is freaking out. They're like, we're going to lose our best talent because you can't bend. So where and how do you see the evolution of what you're doing to the evolution of everyone going back into the real world and how the emotions will be affected? First of all, Jody, to put it simply, Mm -hmm. nothing stays the same. It, it can't. You just said the word evolution. What is evolution? Evolution doesn't mean stagnation. We're never going to stay the same. When, when the world starts to change and shift, we're going to follow suit. Everyone's going to follow suit. I do believe that people that live in fear, and this may not be the right thing to say on camera, but we're going to be vulnerable here. If you're going to constantly live in fear, you are more, your body is more susceptible of getting the virus than the person. And I'm not saying to not be safe and to go out and party and not wear a mask. I'm not saying that, but to live in this constant fear, number one, and I know this is a, this to me, this is a triple fold answer. So, cause I want to weave something in that's important. Um, you can't live in fear with this pandemic and you have to utilize your resources, which is this thing that we're looking at, this screen, this box, which is such a vital resource to get your, whatever you do for a living, use your computers to connect, use your phones. There is a way to have our businesses grow. And maybe we will stay on the internet for, you know, some time until this thing eradicates. But um, I believe we need to, we need to just take a step back and stop living in this terror. Um, I wanted to see something else, Jody, and I know we're kind of like spotty right now. Um, I heard your question, but what I wanted to say prior, prior to the shutdown, which was last March, um, I had been, I finally broke into a, a rape crisis center to teach uh, yoga and mindfulness to girls that have been attacked locally here. And it was my dream to help these girls. And when they were like, yeah, we'll give you a shot. I was like, 
because that's my dream. I, I could teach to a bunch of, you know, lovely ladies, you know, downtown Easton that wear Lululemon. I mean, that's fun too. But to, to really connect with these girls that have been brutalized was my passion. Um, and, and none of that happened to me. I don't know why I have a love for that. I just, I just want to help people. So I was able to work with these girls for quite some time and they allowed me to go to a safe house. Do you know what a safe house is? Mm -hmm. um, they allowed me to go to a safe house and I had cameras on me and I had to watch my speech. I had to watch where I put my hands. It was so unbelievable. These girls had GPSs on their ankles because they had escaped their abusers and their and the children. They had left their kids behind. Really, really ugly, tough stuff. But my God, they, and they couldn't even, half of them couldn't speak English. They gravitated towards the Reiki and the feeling better and the mindfulness. So I did that for a while. Fast forward the lockdown, they wouldn't let me back in the safe house, not even with the mask. And that's when I started to fear, not just for my bank account and more, my business, how are we gonna get these people to feel better? So they did allow me to start teaching online. So I do teach these classes, smaller groups, Jody, because not everybody wants to log in. As you know, not everybody's tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy, but a lot of people fled, but the, the core group that needs help, they log in weekly. Yeah. So I do believe that we're gonna get back out there. I do believe things, gonna, things are gonna change, but my gosh, it took this long to get here. We need to have some patience. We need to have some compassion for what has happened to our country, the world. Um, we need to step back. And I, and I do believe great things are gonna happen. Um, you starting your business, um, you knowing who your target audience is um, and you focusing on Continuing to continuing to add uh, knowledge, so that way you're offering so much more to people. Um, those are all the all the love part of it. Then there's the business part of it. Yeah. Um, running a business as a founder, you're wearing all the different hats. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone that's listening to you right now, where y your business came from everything that you experienced in your lifetime? It literally. Was, it's, a, it's like a literally a nicely packaged life that literally led you to this point. Um, it wasn't a pretty package, but it was a packaged life that led you to this point that you're helping so many people. Um, but you have to do the business part, the marketing, yeah. the operations, the, the pitching yourself. What advice would you tell anyone that is looking to start a business right now? The pandemic has showed them that I don't want to be where I am. Right. And all of a sudden... They're like, I'm so excited about painting or yoga or marketing or whatever. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I go this. I didn't, I didn't think about the whole time marketing part of it or the business right. part of the finance. So what advice would you give to someone that's listening right now? I'm sorry about the lighting, Jody. I had to move because I had a plug in my computer. It was getting that's, low. That's totally um, that's okay. A, that's a great question. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting answer because it, it's going to come from my heart. Yeah. Um, everything comes from my heart because people can read when you're inauthentic and just trying to, dr you know, drum up an answer for Jody's, you know, podcast, hurry up and think of an answer. It's, it's not going to work. It's going to be fake and phony. Jody, first of all, I don't believe, cause I've tried this myself. I don't believe your business survives if you're doing it just for the money. Number one, I believe if you enjoy what you do and if you have faith in your product your service your whatever you want to get out if you're doing it just for financial gain you know there's something called karma that clicks in with this and i'm a huge uh, that's something i'm gonna try to get placement here because the lighting for you no, no, um, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. karma karma is everything and you know whatever you do privately behind closed doors however you live your life it matters. Whatever comes out of your mouth, Jody, on a day-to-day -day basis, it matters. Your thoughts, your thoughts, when nobody else is in your head and you're sitting in bed and you're just thinking about stuff, it matters. It matters to your business. It matters to your the world. So the first part, the first um, segment or, or, or answer I'm going to give you is do 
do what you're passionate about. And I understand we have to have side jobs in life to help us grow and to get the extra paycheck. I'm not saying to not waitress on the side or substitute teach on the side. I mean, I actually love subbing because I get to teach mindfulness to, you know, third graders, or I get to infuse a special part that Andrea likes. But ultimately, I do believe you need to find in some way, shape or form um, a piece of it that's yours and that you love and that you can express yourself through your business. And also, I want to say that you know, there's so many people that think that they have to work hard. And my whole life, Jody, I've worked hard. And I remember my tyrant boss saying to me in New York, he's like, you know, we got to work six days a week and longer hours. We're going to get the orders. And you know what? We did get the orders, Jody. And the, but it, it's because there wasn't that much of this style going on and, and people were gravitating and my phone was ringing off the hook and we're all making this money. But I, let me tell you, I was not happy. I was like working like a dog. I believe that you can work smart and work with ease. It's sometimes, I mean, I usually do prep work before my classes. Like today I work for um, a domestic violence center. I'm working for the staff today. I'm teaching the staff members that are in, still in lockdown and dealing with horrific, horrific things. When their phone rings, it's not the same phone call that you and I get. They deal with death on a daily basis. It's bad. So I have to prep myself, but I don't prep myself with nervous energy. I prep myself as if those women are my girlfriends and I do a check-in and how are you feeling this morning? You know what? I woke up at like a 55, which means I didn't sleep great last night. You know, I tossed and turned a little bit, but I just, I did a little stretching and I had my lemon water and I started to calm down because there's authenticity there. And I believe when you are authentic to whoever you're presenting to and um, you, I just believe you come across as real. I believe that person on the other side is gonna do business with you because you are real. So there's my twofold, do it with ease, do what you love and, and, and be confident. And if somebody is not gonna gravitate towards your product, towards your service, let it go. I think that's one of the things that people freak out the most about, especially when you're with a small business, they do. I mean, it's, it's easy to say for small businesses not to focus on the money, but um, they left a large company to do their passion that will lead to, and it will. I always tell all my clients, it will lead to financial security, but you have to be patient and you have to be smart about like who, like you knew who you wanted to target as a client. You knew who you wanted to go after. Some people just kind of flail and spit in the wind. And I'm like, know what you offer, know who will benefit from it and everything else will come. And I think yeah. one of the things that people forget, they forget because they, they think about, I have a bill, I have a bill, I have a bill, I have a bill. I go, those bills will never go away if you're obsessing on them. You just have to focus. You have to focus. All right. Two more questions before we go. Um, okay. The pandemic, how has it been for you? So you're starting a business. So like we're just like focusing on yep, yep. business. You're a mom. I go and you're targeting your audience. And then all of a sudden the pandemic happened. So how was the pandemic for you? Like how, what, what was added? What was taken out? How did you pivot your business? Just yep. my, like I, I, what's your comments on that? So um, great question. I didn't just start the business though this year. It's been, it's been around for almost three years now. So it no, didn't no, start I, 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 the I pandemic. Didn't to, yeah. I didn't mean to imply that. It's just oh, no, 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 I know. So okay. um, um, actually it was during the first lockdown last March, really, really tough because we all had this fear and anxiety in our bodies. Didn't know what we were doing. We're all frailing around trying to, trying to get my, my kids go back and forth to their dad's house, which is a mile away, which is great. So they're being shuffled, they, they're hybrid, they only go to school two days a week. So I went from being out all day to going to safe houses and old age homes and, and crisis centers to nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I did have that freak out moment, but I, I remember it started to evolve because we all gravitated to this thing in front of us. And, um, the companies started to allow me to teach online. And um, I don't know, 
Jody, my business evolved in, in sort of a, um, in a nice way because I got to spend, they were had terrible times as well with my little boys, like fighting and logging off and not doing their homework. But once we got into the groove and my kids have two homes, um, things started to get better. And I hope I'm not skipping something. Um, my business is doing fine. Everything's online. I get to see my kids. We've worked it out where they study in two different rooms. I take the living room. I do all my yoga and my business in my in my great room here. Um, I, things are good. We've learned how to live life like this. Children are adaptable. We Absolutely. as humans are, we can do this. We can adapt. How is it gonna be after all this and go back out into the real world? Guess what? We're going to adopt that new way of life as well. Yeah. So um, I did lose a little bit of business, but not, it wasn't enormous, but I did lose some. Yeah. I have to say that I love that you just said that we will adapt. Um, people forget that all the time. We will adapt. Um, it's, it's easier to say like, I, like, I mean, when I still see people like losing their minds, I'm like, you know, it's been a couple of months now. I mean, it's not been a couple of, it's been a lot of months. I think that you were going to be upset if it wasn't even a pandemic. So I think it's no longer the pandemic's fault. I think it's just a little bit of you. <laughs> wow. Well <laughs> said. And I agree with you because you know what, Jody? there are days I don't even think of it. Yeah. I, have, I have to prep for my class. What, what am I going to do different? You yeah. know, I still have to, you know, feed my kids. I have to go online. I have to get some new information. I'm always studying something. I have to learn something new and, and, and give it to these wonderful women that I work with. Yep. So move on, move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Think, it's, 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 it's so, no, it is, it, it is one of, I mean, it's one of those moments where um, it makes me laugh still. I mean, I go down the street and like, I'm going for my run or, and I'm like, I go, how are you doing? Happy, like happy X, Y, Z day. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And then they're like, and they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, I go, despite 2020, I'm like, they're like, I go, it, it, no, I'm sorry. Usually I hear that, well, it can't be as bad as 2020. I'm like, are you not here? Did you not wake up? I'm thinking if you're here and you woke up and some, I mean, and a family members, close family members or friends are still alive and well, I'm thinking you have nothing in a bitch and moan about. Just saying. That's, yeah. I know people could be mad at me, but I'm like, I go, I'm going to say, be mad at me because you got up this morning to bitch and moan. So shut Thank up. You. Right. Well, what that's what we do. We that's actually my topic for this week. I have a topic per week for these two uh -huh. these two uh, crisis centers, and it's like set the intention of your day because Jody, when you set the intention for your day, you're setting the intention for your life. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. Oh my god, I love it. All right, last question. Yeah. Again, we could have talked for three hours. I know. Could have talked for three hours. Um, uh, if you had a personal ask and a professional ask of anyone that's listening to you right now. So I, I need two answers, a personal ask and a professional ask. What would you say to the audience? Like I'm asking them about their business. No, no, you're it's, it's, it's yours. It's like, you're personally asking the audience about something for you and you're professionally asking the audience for something for you. It's a tough one, Jody. Um, what makes you smile? What makes you happy? I need to know that. I need to know that because we're all so different and we all tick in different ways. Um, and I would ask that professionally too, because, and it, it's like, I, I ask that because my business is very um, mindful. So I would, I would ask that to anybody um, professionally or personally, like what makes your heart sing what makes you open your eyes just a little wider what moves you and this may be a different conversation if you were talking to somebody from you know deutsche bank you know they they may start to go into you know this number sequence and i like to get human and I just like to know what makes people tick. I love it. You know what? Um, I, this is, I love this conversation because it started in such a different way than most conversations. Um, it, it started in regards of getting to know who you are, but what I love the most about it is you being raw. And I mean, you've always, since we're little, we, you've always <laughs> and, and who you are, which is, which I love. 
Um, but people have to understand that you have to start from somewhere to be where you are right now. And not all of it is good. I mean, you're, no. you're, you're, you're reading biographies of people, whether it's a Oprah, whether it's a Steve Jobs, whether it's a right, book, right. reading all these stories and not everything is picture perfect. But as you go through life, as you, if, as long as you can learn, you're learning from who you are and what, and how you want to help other people the, the connect. And I love you shared so much of you and you had, I mean, I mean, again, you've never been, you've never been shy. You've never been shy. Well, well I was prior oh, to, me, I love that prior to meeting you, but I feel like our high school molded us, Jody. And I feel like we and our, and our parents did too. And your dad yeah. and my dad, but you know, we were forced to open up because yeah. I was shy at one time. I was shy way back in the I day. I don't remember that at all. What are you talking yeah. about? No, again. I was, my mother's <laughs> painfully shy. And, but you know what? You, I believe there's, we shed daily. I feel like you exfoliate, if that makes sense. We shed a layer daily. And when somebody really sees who you are inside, it's like, you know, take it or leave it. This is where I'm from. This is what I've been through. I'm still learning about myself. We'll never stop learning about. I hope not. Are. I really hope not. I mean, look, every day, I mean, I, I have those aha moments. I have the giggle moments. I have the, just the, the joys of like, Oh my God, like you've just done a lot and I can't wait to see what happens next. So I know like, it's, 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 it's exciting when you're excited about yourself as well as other people. So yeah, it's where I love that you are constantly saying like, I go like in people, look, some people would use the example of a snake. I'm like, I go, you know what? A snake is living his life. I know that, that snake is totally fine. And yeah, he's shedding himself. I go, but he's still living his life. So don't mind, don't mind the snake. Um, but I do love that you use that, ex that exfoliating and just shedding. And it's true. I mean, because a scientist will tell you, like, I mean, like literally all those little mites, the dust mites. Yeah. That's you. That's yeah. The that's you. Yeah, that's true. Gross so Jody, I, I love that what you do. I love that you um, help people become more vocal and, and, and you, you make us open up. I love podcasts, by the way, because I, I watch a lot of podcasts and I, I love, I love, them. I love the, podcasts. the realness and the rawness and the authenticity. And then when people see it, even if you help one person, one person that may watch this and say, you know what? I need that. And Jody brought this to, to the forefront. And I didn't really know a lot about that because I, I learned something new every day. Uh, you know, I watch a, a, a specific person, um, podcast every day. And I just, I, I love it. I do it while I'm in the bathroom or I just put it aside. I'll be getting ready for a meeting and I listen and, and we learn. So I appreciate you bringing this stuff to the table. Well, you know what the thing is, a lot of people need to find you. A lot of people need to be inspired. Even if they don't call on you, they need to hear these stories and be inspired. And when you're doing, um, a re if, if you're um, able to like get a regular interview, it's the seven minutes. I can't get to know who you are in seven minutes. No. In the media, we did long form interviews and I really loved those moments because you really got to know the person on a different level. And so yeah. before your business, you need to understand who you are because you yeah. grew into this person that created this business, this service, this product, and more people need to know that. And so I am very thankful for you for taking your morning and just talk. Yeah. You're welcome. It's my yeah. so, so I said there and talk about time references. Don't use time references. And I just did it. I just did it. Oh, bad. that's okay. Oh, it is what it is. You're human. <laughs> but thank you so very much, honey bunny. I mean, I really, thank really you, Jody. yes. When we are able to like travel about, I go, yes, I will like literally come down to Easton and we will have coffee, tea. Let's do it. Um, Let's do champagne, it. whatever. I would love it. I would I'm love my, it. I, I love my like, champagne or tequila or bourbon are my three things. So it's one of those three things. I know. Like I, Sauvignon Blanc, but you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. You know what? Because I'm, I'm wine is so boring for me right now. I mean, yeah. I, if I go to a vineyard, it's one thing. I will always support going to a vineyard, but if I have to have my choices, champagne, bourbon, and tequila, and I'm not a cheap date, just saying. <laughs> she told me. Um, <laughs> But Jody, let's, let's let's put that down because um, I think that would be really nice to reminisce because we have a lot to talk about. Oh my God, we do. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you to death. Um, Love you too. We'll talk to you soon. Oh, All right. this, is, this is not the last conversation. We're going to have more conversations like this. So just be aware. Yes, I'm ready to do more. Let's do it. All right. Bye, honey. Bye, Joe. Take care.